destroy it. Thank you very much. Okay, emojis, everyone can hear me, fantastic. Thank you so much. Right, well, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Tim Jackson. I am the diversity track lead along with my colleague here, Anna, who's Hello. Actually, oh, on to my left. Hi. Uh, we run the diversity track. Uh, loads of events going on today, so it would be great to see you all of them. Um, so our first event of the day is with Thomas Logan. And Thomas Logan is the CEO and owner of Equal Entry. And Thomas has spent the last 17 years assisting organizations to create technology solutions that work for people with disabilities. Over his career, Thomas has delivered projects for numerous federal, state and local government agencies, as well as private sector organizations from startups to Fortune 500 companies. He is the owner of Equal Entry, whose mission is contributing to a more accessible world. That's their tagline. He's also the co-organizer of Accessibility New York, which is a monthly meetup for people interested in topics related to accessibility and people with disabilities. And I'm sure Thomas will give you the details of those if you ask him for them. And Thomas is currently based in Tokyo, Japan. So who wow. knows what time it is for you, Thomas, today? <laughs> it's only what 6 time is it where you are? It's only 6 p.m. Perfect. Okay, perfect cool. Me. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to move out of your way, my friend. Uh-huh. All righty. And I'll let you go center stage. Great. Okay. All right. And um, over to you. Hi. All right. Um, so I'm also at Tech Thomas on Twitter. Um, so I think all of Tim's introduction otherwise, though, is great. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you guys about um, accessibility. Um, I have done a lot of work, uh, sp mostly speculative work, in how to make virtual reality environments accessible. So I'm always eager to meet more people that work in, in this particular space. Um, there's a lot of work to be done uh, and there's a lot of opportunities. So today I'm hoping just in like a 20, 25 minutes to give you an overview of some of the, uh, the barriers that I've found in VR and also, um, also learn from you, like maybe some of your questions or discussions as, as we move along. Uh, so Tim, next slide, please. Um, just to set you in the real world where I am, I, I am here in uh, Tokyo, Japan. So I was formerly in New York City, and as mentioned, I still organize um, a meetup in New York City. So I'm living this virtual life a little bit um, in that respect, too, that uh, I live in Japan, but I do a lot of work um, in America, and my, my work is uh, solely focused on uh, working with technology and getting it to work for people with disabilities. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a quick screenshot from my company website, but just to say that Equal Entry is a consulting organization. As mentioned, you know, I've been working in the field for 17 years. Um, my colleagues that work with me at Equal Entry, we have a similar amount of experience, and we're really passionate about just making a difference with technology and that's why it's so amazing to be here um, in XR because it's like Yay. if I see that let's make a difference here. <laughs> All right next slide please. Okay so the, the very first one um, the very first point in just in bold here captions are important so <clears throat> for me typically giving a presentation I would be having um, what's called CART or communication access real-time text translation occurring. And so on the screen or in this image, this is from my meetup in New York City, um, but we, we do a monthly um, meetup where we stream live stream and have people come in uh, to the physical space. And Mira by Night that's up there on the screen, she is a stenographer that can type, I think it's about 250 words per minute. It's, it's amazing. She can even present and type um, at the same time. But basically, when we work with Mira by Night in our events, she is sometimes not there, so she's working remotely or virtually as well. She listens to the audio stream and she's typing um, <clears throat> actually what the presenter's speaking. So if she was here today, every word I'm saying, she would be typing out and there would be this visual display for people that are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, it's also great for people where English is a second language, for example, since I'm speaking in English, 
Um, I find it also helpful as someone with ADHD or attention deficit. Uh, a lot of times I forget <laughs> what the speaker was saying and I want to quote them on Twitter or do something like this. So having real time captions that are accurate is extremely important. And um, if we go to the, the next slide, um, in Altspace VR, for example, the platform that we're in, there's not really like a designed feature for this. So, you know, I would love that if there were, I would have already been like, let's have Mirabai here with me today for my presentation and um, have make, produce that kind of real-time text translation. There is on the screen, um, <laughs> and there's some kind of choice language in the screenshot, but this is showing a chat view in Altspace. So they do have the functionality to have sort of real-time text chat. So I think it's quite close. It's just really though going into like as educators or as um, you know people that are working in this field, it really should be something built into the platforms that we use as educators. So I, sh I shouldn't need to hack around and find a way to maybe like pull up a chat box. Um, I should be able to really design like the tech stream of um, for people that are deaf and hard of hearing or people that want to have that view, um, I should be able to pull that up. So I just showing that Allspace at least does have this sort of rudimentary way to do it, but I would love to see a more designed way to have real-time text for presentation. Uh, Tim, next slide, please. Um, this was a great presentation, great research from um, <clears throat> the Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT, in New York. Um, so they have done a lot of research. Wendy Gannels is the professor. Um, she's been working with the HoloLens and even going beyond thinking about text translation, she, she's actually thinking about like sign language interpretation, for example. So uh, in her scenarios, um, for example, in this presentation, projecting a video or having a real-time person, um, you know, in this case, sign language is quite detailed, so we would need the fidelity of like a video. But to, it's very powerful with uh, XR technologies that um, one of the problems currently is like if you were trying to do, make a planetarium accessible is, is something that she spoke about. And, you know, a planetarium is very dark, so it's very difficult if someone needed to get sign language interpretation to see an interpreter in the dark. And that's one of the powerful tools or like benefits that we have working with these XR technologies um, in this screen or in this slide right here, she's showing that basically with the technology, the wearer of the um, hollow lens can choose where to position the interpreter. Um, and they might choose, I don't want the sign language interpreter, I just want um, a text translation, but it becomes something quite cool with the technology that we're all wearing right now, that this becomes something that um, in education um, scenarios becomes something where we can make better designed educational experiences. And um, I, I'll have links to more of the details on this research, but her information is great. And I thought the planetarium is an excellent scenario to think about this problem, but there's obviously billions of other uh, educational uh, pieces where this problem exists, that a sign language interpreter does take up physical space, you have to position them around, all of this. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so this piece, uh, this is going to be a little hard to do without video, but I wanted to um, <clears throat> basically illustrate that all of the, uh, a lot of the projects that I see currently in education are uh, 360 video, so immersive video, but it still is playing on a track. And the, the point of the video is that you can look in any direction, right, and see different things that are happening. So we're doing a presentation, uh, my company Equal Entry, James Herndon from my company is going to be presenting <clears throat> on this topic um, at the CSUN conference in California. But the idea is people that are blind or people that are low vision, um, they are going to need descriptions of what's happening in the video if they can't see the video. Um, so this is already enough of a challenge with something like Netflix, you know, uh, just for a 2D view or a flat view, you need a description of what's occurring. When you go into 360, it becomes, well, what do I need to describe? Should I describe <clears throat> all of the different views that are available? And how do I actually surface that just to the learner or the person that's um, experiencing um, the environment? So we've done um, 
together for this uh, conference presentation, a lot of detailed analysis. We've done some National Geographic videos. Um, we're, this, this slide is showing uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night, like the um, artistic uh, 360 video that's quite popular. And this slide is just to show that depending on how someone is positioned in the screen, it's probably confusing if you're positioned the wrong direction. Um, and getting described what's happening in the experience. So the experience starts, you basically go through a doorway into like um, the house and then you see the starry night. If you look in the backwards direction, it's not a very natural um, experience. So hard to get into too many details here, but just to get your thoughts going on this, like if you're creating 360 degree media um, and you think about, well, how would I make that work for people that are blind and low vision? It does matter which way you're looking, and then how do how do we like get that information available um, to learners so that they can, you know, not have to spend maybe ten times as long processing the video as someone else. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide from Second Life. Um, so I have a much longer, like almost two hour presentation um, that I did at the Accessibility New York meetup about accessibility best practices for VR. And I took a lot of lessons from Second Life because it was really the most you know, dominant virtual reality platform. And, and they did have a lot of academic work in how to you know, implement accessibility educational best practices. This particular world in Second Life is this um, teaching environment. Um, and this is showing actually the idea of enlarged text and how do you make sure that in your environment, text, when, anytime you have text, that it's readable? Um, I love for our preparation for this conference, the slide deck, you know, really emphasized we need to be using very large point fonts for the presentations we're doing for you all today. But this does become something, you know, in whatever environment's being designed, we have to think about how text becomes readable. We don't want it to have to be magnified like in this room by like having to physically walk up, you know, and be very close. Uh, to this slide, that would be awkward for, you know, some participants inside of the environment. So it's something to, to think about, I think, in all experiences is anytime you display text, how can you um, allow it to be enlarged and potentially how can you allow it to be rendered in different fonts? Because sometimes, you know, for example, people with dyslexia, they may have a different font or a different spacing between words and characters that aids their readability. And these are things that right now, there's not really platform ways to do the technology. That's very important. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so my next point is just all about avatars. So I see we've got a range of people here in the audience today. Great, great to see everyone. Um, we have um, some people that are in robot costumes. We have some people that have you know, done more styling or maybe wearing particular shirts. Uh, on the screen, I have some examples of avatars from the Mozilla Hub application. And there's two points in this avatar point that I want to make. Um, one is, again, for people who are blind and low vision, which I've spent a lot of my career thinking about access um, for these people. One, it's like, well, I might still want to get a description of what you're wearing, e even if you don't tell me in the virtual world. So there needs to be this mechanism or this way to give that information. But two, and what I think is more of my salient point here in the deck, if we go to the next slide, um, we're really talking about representation. This is Judy Brewer from the W3C. So the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, is one of the you know working groups that actually helps enforce and create technical standards uh, for how we make information accessible. Uh, Judy Brewer had uh, many years ago an experience in Segway where she said, uh, when I first, uh, sorry, Second Life, she said, when I first came into Second Life, I found I had acquired some new abilities. I could walk. Uh, I can't walk in real life. I could fly. I could even teleport. I felt more comfortable seated, and so I got a Segway scooter to move around in the world. And so this is something very important about Second Life was that it was so customizable that um, for Judy, you know, uh, and for any person with a disability, you may be choosing in a virtual environment to say, I don't want people to see my 
disability. I want to appear like everyone else. But on the flip side, and what I think most of these platforms don't consider, it's like, no, my disability is part of me the same way maybe some of us in the audience here, you, you're trying to make your avatar look as much like you. That should be available in every platform where you have this avatar creation. You should be able to um, represent yourself, you know, as close to how you are in the real world, if that's your choice. Um, so Judy was actually saying she she prefers using a um, segue um, in real life, and she loved that in that she could do that in Second Life. Um, so next slide, please. I thought it was interesting. You know, if you look at Microsoft's work, uh, Microsoft was one of the first platforms with Xbox to actually allow um, avatars to get. Uh, wheelchairs and prosthetics. So they, they do have in their more sophisticated avatar building for the Xbox <clears throat> sort of avatar creation, you can include some aspects of these disabilities. And the other image I have is of a um, motorized wheelchair um, that was in Second Life. But again, just showing these look quite different, these two wheelchairs. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, this was something I thought very interesting that if you think about the physical world in wheelchairs, you need to think about physical access and can a wheelchair fit into certain areas. If you look around the room that we're in today, right, like there's um, stairs, right, to get up um, and get to the different seats. This is just another um, interesting area that was explored in Second Life was actually almost like applying design standards to virtual worlds to say, hey, if someone's in a wheelchair, maybe the box of their avatar is going to be larger you need to design a space that physically allows for like that box to move through and so there was sort of some exclusionary experiences and educational experiences in second life where uh certain customized avatars couldn't fit into rooms or would like fall off of the room so i, I just thought that's very interesting and uh illustrative and, and something to, to think about um next slide Um, this was also amazing that in Second Life, they actually did have um, guide dogs or seeing eye dogs, you know, sometimes as they're referred to. So this idea in Second Life was that avatars that were blind could have this sort of AI seeing eye, uh, seeing eye dog that could move the avatar to certain uh, locations in the space. So I was thinking about like our space here today, there's a, an area outside the exit area where we can go to meet and have further discussions after the talk. Um, if this alt space platform had a way for someone who is blind uh, to, you know, to alternatively navigate the space, maybe, you know, that they could use the seeing eye dog or a cane or have some type of um, environmental cue to actually navigate in this virtual world to find that space. Next slide, please. Um, this is just uh, from uh, my most encouraged point right now for uh, accessibility work in this space. Uh, so the GLTF format is quite popular for um, producing accessibility objects. And so this is showing that just at its simplest form, there's a component now called model viewer that you can actually use in the web and set alt attributes for. So if you're familiar with accessibility, alt attribute is typically the way you describe this visual object for someone that's blind. In VR and XR, there's really not a great way to set this attribute or give this information. And so this, I just wanted to highlight that this is something, at least in the starting point of showing that you do have a way, like if you are hosting a virtual object on a web page to add an alt attribute. But I'm also here to say, well, we need that for like like alt space, I should be able to label, you know, my vest that I'm wearing or that there's a red chair. Um, so that's a much larger topic, but area to consider and area to think about. Next slide, please. Where we've been doing very good, for, at least for me with the slides. It looks like we might have gotten to this. Okay. I'm just right, that's where we were. What are you seeing at the moment? Uh, I see black screen for me or flickering. Okay. And then what can you see?
Right now, I'm seeing a W three C slide. Okay. You can see the checkpoint slide now. Okay, great. Well, I can't see like that, but I can tell you about that slide. And this Did is a good accessibility go feature. Right. Okay, <laughs> Thomas, I've just gone back a slide. So what you're now seeing is the net. The, what would have been the next slide? Okay. Can you tell me what the title is? Uh, Mozilla Hubs yeah. for Social VR. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So. What I wanted to highlight is um, even before I set this up, this, this event's amazing, right? Um, I actually did work today with one of my teammates who's blind. And unfortunately, Altspace was like a total non-starter, even about thinking about getting into the, uh, the doorway, right? Like as, as we say in accessibility. So even logging in on a Windows machine, at least for her with a screen reader, she wasn't able to log in. And so it's, it's a, like a non-starter if she wanted to attend my talk um, and we're only hosting it in this virtual environment, she's, she's being excluded. And this is definitely something I'll be, you know, following up with all the event people here to make sure um, people are aware of. And also with the Altspace team, it's like this really shouldn't, it's not acceptable to be that difficult uh, just even to join in. Maybe the extra features are going to take more time, but right now she wasn't able to join. I wanted to highlight Mozilla Hubs, um, which does have a team that has interest in the accessibility work. Um, I was able to get her uh, to join me in, in Mozilla Hubs and hear me presenting and talking. And so I, I think I just wanted to highlight this is going to be a challenge as educators with whatever platform you look at. There's always going to be different pluses and minuses for accessibility, but it is our responsibility to make sure that people that develop these platforms know that it's their responsibility to have this functionality and we should reward platforms um, that have the accessibility features and that are inclusive and we should make sure platforms that are popular um, that maybe aren't following those practices that we make our voices heard and we you know either tell them with procurement at a university for example hey we're not going to buy your software till you get this working for all of our students we as an example, I think it's very important that they hear that message um, because a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, n none of those students are using this. So why, why we don't need to focus on that, for example, or this is a new technology. And for me, I get very concerned with that, knowing that it is being used in education and, and not wanting people um, to be excluded. So hubs pretty good for now. Still, obviously, more work there, too. But um, I just wanted to point that out. And it's like we have choices in each platform we use for education. And the next slide, I think, is the W3C one. That's correct. Okay, so the W3C uh, draft tech point is mm -hmm. to say one one way to get involved if this is an area you're um, passionate about. And thank you again for coming to hear me talk today. Uh, the W3C does have a working group where they're building checkpoints that are like the web, uh, web content accessibility guidelines that are used to make web information accessible. They are in this uh, process now of you know, developing those. And so if you're someone very passionate in this space, um, they have that uh, working group that's working on those technical standards. And then on the my last slide before we get to Q&A, um, uh, the XR Access Initiative is at xraccess.org. Uh, again, another great um, area. It's got academics, it's got private industry, um, and it's people working together in various working groups that are about how to make XR uh, information accessible. And so, again, if you're very passionate in this area, I, I highly recommend um, getting involved with that site. It's free to join, um, and they're definitely looking for motivated people to help advance uh, this topic. And with that, uh, I think we're now in the Q&A slide. I really appreciate um, Tim and Anna for the opportunity to speak with you all and look forward to doing some Q&A. Thank you very, very much indeed, Thomas. Let's have some emojis for Thomas's uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, basically uh, you're all muted at the moment, but if any of you would like to um, ask a question, then you can just use the uh, hand emoji and that will then pop above your head. And then I can then tell if any of you want to ask a, a question and then I will then come to you individually and call out your username and that will then prompt you to ask a question. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please do use the hand emoji. 
but it's the it's the one that's on the right hand side of your emojis not the clapping one the one so it looks like this that should actually just put a hand above the top of mm. your head so if anyone would like to ask a question please do so while we're waiting for that 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 was a great demo too of something to think about from um, again this accessibility perspective so the the emojis that we have in alt space we have um, love clap um, you know sad I can't fully describe all these but the raising the hand one I thought is especially important that again picture that there was someone blind or maybe someone that is only using their voice to control the computer right now if I needed to raise my hand you know, in this environment. With a screen reader, there's not a way to get to the raise hand emoji, so I never get called on. Um, with voice technologies, these things don't have a programmatic layer, so there's not a way that if I can't control, like uh, I'm using the Quest at this moment, um, but I wouldn't have a way to click on that if I, if I can't actually use this physical controller. So that's um, just something I thought was interesting to also mention about this specific environment, and it really varies from environment to environment, like what the behaviors become, like what should be made accessible. But I think in this environment, it would be great, like if I was the speaker, for example, I'd want to know if I was blind and can't see everyone raising their hand, like I'd like to know how many people raise their hand or how many people are sending a heart emoji. Uh, so just another okay. additional thought. That's lovely. Thank you, Thomas. We have, do have a couple of questions. Yeah, um, great. So, um, Socrates? Yes. Yeah, are you there? Would you like uh, to ask your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I come from Germany, and uh, my question is... Yeah, we can't hear you, Socrates. You've, you've gone quiet on us. Do you want to try again? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yes. hear you now, yes. Yeah, ask your question. Yes, uh, my question is, I came from Germany, and my uh, question is, do you support other languages in the future than uh, English? For example, English or French with your uh, project? So, um, just just in general, like accessibility as a um, as a broad topic, um, it it does vary country by country as far as what motivates people to work on this topic. And so, um, I, I would say that um, obviously, like there there is accessible technology in all the different nations, but it does depend potentially like which country you're in. Maybe if there's like a legal reason that you have to be accessible or there's a, a, a real risk. Um, and I would say that that's one of the, normally in America that we have way too many lawsuits, but it's one of the things for accessibility that because there is this legal system in the US, um, a lot of the educational institutions, uh, I don't know of a case with XR technologies currently where a student is saying they've been excluded from learning uh, because like a professor was using XR tech and they couldn't participate, but you can imagine that type of situation happening in the U.S. And uh, with, with Germany, you know, there's a law called EN301549 that kind of is similar to the U.S.'s Section 508 law around procurement of accessible technologies. So long-winded answer to say, like, I think uh, accessibility is getting worked on in all these different countries, but I do find that when there's a legal bite to it, there's more of a uh, forcing function for people to, to make these improvements instead of saying, oh, we'll get to it in 10 years from now. It's lovely. Thank you, Thomas. We have another question from mm -hmm. uh, from Zeke. Uh, hey, Zeke, would you like to ask your question? Um, yes. So with VR, it's uh, good for people with disabilities. So are there plans to use VR as a way to meet people, but also use it as a real world counterpart? So like you kind of use VR to teach people about the disability or um, 
they can meet other disability people in the real world, even though they're using VR, but there would be like a real world meetup and kind of in between there. Well, I definitely think that's um, a great idea. And I mean, if, if it's not happening, it should be happening. Someone should start that right away. Um, I know that my my I did a lot of research into the second life world and the thing that was very fascinating to me um, was around you know people who were amputees and and noting that maybe um, people that were using second life to find a community that there there was quite a large um, amputee community in second life and it, it's not something in my work that I come across you know in consulting with like tech companies for example to learn about this and it was interesting. I don't know about the part about meeting up in real world, but I do know that it was really powerful in Second Life, for example, for that community to have this space where they could um, all relate to each other. And that, and that goes into the avatar customization, too, that I, I know that it was really important in that community to be able to represent you know, what their body looked like in, in the various uh, um, configurations. Um, and then and the other part is um, actually the education piece, I think that is an opportunity. Um, you know, there's there's discussion. I've seen I've seen both sides of it where people say simulating disabilities with VR is a bad thing. I've seen people say um, it does help teach empathy. I personally am like open to <laughs> having every experience and, and learning from like what other people tell me. But I, I do know that um you know, conceptually, that's a topic that a lot of people are interested. Like, how, how could we help someone understand, like, what this space feels like in a wheelchair? Um, oh, I wouldn't be able to go up the stairs here. You know, is that a good or a bad thing um, with VR? I think it's open, but I think that's there are a lot of research ideas in that space. Lovely. Thank, Thank you, Thomas. Um, Anna, you have a question? Um, yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so, Thomas, in terms of comparing accessibility features and actually the immersion levels uh, on different platforms, um, which, if you could compare, which do you think of the two um, is more important in terms of enjoyment or um, of making um, people with disabilities uh, feeling better in those worlds? Uh, enjoy, you explain enjoyment? In terms that uh, some of those people use the platforms, um, you know, like to uh, feel better, to do things that they oh, yeah. uh, cannot really do in real life. Um, yeah, they use as an entertainment means or as a socialization means. But I mean, yeah, I think, imagine uh... that they have the access to those worlds and then when entering those worlds in terms of the immersion levels, if you could compare accessibility and immersion levels, do you think they are the same kind of, they should be at the same kind of percentage in terms of the way that um, this should be designed? Yeah, I think I, I, I pretty much, I probably have a very set way of view because I've my whole career has been in like the actual just making sure things are possible. So I think the What's cool in the VR, the creative space in this, like this whole area of like, um, you know, meeting people, the socializing, the, the aspect of immersion, all of it is really important. And, and for me, it would be, I think these manufacturers of these platforms, there's really not a reason they can't be considering these topics now. So I'm always going to just come from a, like, yeah, do everything and not also like don't say that it's a very far off problem to solve, which is what I struggle with. And that's why I did the second life research was because um, I got frustrated with companies saying this is such a new topic. We haven't had time to think about it. And it's like, well, no, actually, uh, second life thought about um, a lot of these different topics as an example for social VR. I mean, there's always new things to explore, but um, I would be my position would be I want to make sure it's possible first. And then enjoyment yep. should come first from like making sure that it's possible. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and Robert, Robert, do you have a question that you would like to ask Thomas? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I'm a visitor here from Somnium Space, also one of your hosts um, over this week. Um, mm. And I Welcome, was just Robert. basically 
Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I was just basically thinking with all the technology that's out there at the moment, especially with these sensor suits and things like that, um, mm -hmm. I don't see why we can't be thinking about Braille by actually creating things and putting them in world. Um, and then someone having the ability to actually use these sensor gloves to skim over the Braille and actually get a, a, a real life connection with people in a VR sense. Do you see that being uh, something that tech could develop and work with your sort of uh, layout in the future? Oh my gosh, well, I think that's great. And yes, I think I think that should be happening. I think um, haptics is actually like, you know, there's so much more to be done with this. Um, I think when, whenever I even notice like little small haptic things on my iPhone, for example, like, uh, you know, not even to the degree of, um, being able to read Braille, but just feeling like a click between like how fast I dial um, an alarm in of like when, when I'm setting a time, that that type of feedback for people who are blind, it gets very overloaded to have to rely on audio. Uh, if you've ever listened to a screen reader, uh, it's uh, oftentimes people are listening to those at like 200 words per minute, you know, talking about blah, 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 you know, because they need to process so much information and touch is a much more natural you know, and an additional way to transmit information. So I would say, yes, absolutely. I don't know much research um, in that area yet, but I'd love to learn more. And if anyone's working on that, I'd love to learn about it and, and try it out. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, it's lovely. Thank you, Thomas. And we have now another question from Ethan. So Ethan, would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? Um. Wait. No? Okay, Ethan, no problem. Right, I think that was our last question, uh, which was an uh, interesting way to finish the session. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much, Thomas. That was a very, very interesting talk. Can we have some emojis, please, for Thomas? Wonderful. Thank you, thank thank you, you so, so much. much. <laughs> Uh, and that brings to the end this particular session. We have another session in here, I think, uh, in about uh, 15 minutes or so. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed the talk with Thomas. And uh, thank you, Thomas. It was a very, very interesting talk today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Thomas. for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Right, okay, so what I'll do, I'll clear the presentation off the screen. Anna, can you still hear me? Yeah. Good, okay. okay I wasn't sure if Thomas yeah. was talking to me then. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't here. I was. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so I'll just end off the presentation ready for the next next uh, <laughs> so no, that was really cool. thank you so much i will be really back interesting. in to see you guys later on in the day so good luck with the rest of the lovely <laughs> thank you yeah thanks, great thanks, thanks thomas thanks. take care right. Right. bye um if anyone does want to talk to me i'm going to go over to this side over here <laughs> Ended up teleporting over here. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> here we go. Are you are you muted? Okay, Anna. Uh, yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. We we only had um, a slight glitch. But yeah. We managed to get around that, so that was good. And that only happened sort of to, well, I mean, we, we, it helped with me stepping so in and being able to. So, we actually well. have a talk. At All right, everybody is so. unmuted now. If you are on um, megaphone, please anymore. go off megaphone and oh, let me turn, turn to off. regular speaking voice. Uh, uh, Excellent. Thank you very much, Jay. Yeah, so we're having a talk on... Um, um, I think Danny wants me to mention what the next the event is. Event. That's right, Tim, all right, Anna, just popping in to say hi, you guys rock. Really hey. cool, well done. And like, 
Yes, sorry, I didn't have the schedule. I didn't have the schedule in front of me. Sorry, Daniel. That's okay. Um, so who's next? So who's next? Um, I'm going to learn a lot. We should be having. Um, I've tried one. Um, other. Okay, Pam also creating a Kali twelve. Tool that and only exists in VR. Actually, that's what um, he's is, looking uh, to track. Uh, that is. I have a, I've seen a lot of. Uh, 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 that's the general uh, general topics track. Mm. I think it's just, just so that you can yeah. yes. General yeah, topics yeah, can from the um, live stream. Yeah. So yeah. like you could schedule participate. Um, it, we do it on YouTube. Uh, okay. She'll be talking. So yeah. what I should so do then we'll at the end of the session just mention what's coming next. Yeah, it's in here. Where, where uh, have we got the track leaders here, or uh, you're not the track leaders for that, are you? Oh, okay. Not for general, no. Yeah, so no. Be kind of okay, so in that <laughs> case, the track leaders will come in, and they will bring up the slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Control them, and then they'll be stay for long enough to call them too, back. And, um, yeah, would you be sure. able to do that? Like, I'll put yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, do that. So, uh, okay, cool. From um, the Helen Hamlet Our next session is a little bit later, so... Yeah, yeah, just next time, make sure you talk about the following on events. You know, um, okay, people who want to come to this event, yeah. they will see it and they will join. Now, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, I didn't realize. So sorry. What kind of? No, it's all right. It happens. Um, so yeah, expect a few more people to come in. Uh, if you want to come to the side here, and um, I'll see if I can find the general track leaders. Okay, I'll send them in. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Daniel. All right, no problem. See you in a bit. Well, I'll just. Um, so from from my perspective, it's like the widest variety possible. Like it's kind of. It should be available to everyone. In, in my work, um, what typically happens is people that are blind in low vision are usually <laughs> where I'm getting involved because that's where a lot of the knowledge comes from. Okay, Tim, I'm going. Um, I'll see you later. Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, it's not about. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Okay, bye. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, thank you. Anna, thank you, could bye, you do me a favor Perfect. just before yeah. you go? Anna, could you do me a favor? Yeah. Could you just jump into the social round and see if there's anyone there? But, um, and if there is, just let them know that the next session is going to start in 10 minutes. Just say okay, hi. Okay, yeah. Tell them yeah, we'll. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay. All right. Bye. 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 That's yeah, that's fine. That's good. Um, that allows the next group to come in and then set up. And exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, if there were so more longer technical issues, we have a bit at the beginning. So yeah, that's yeah. fine. So it's all good. Sure that right. Did that, that look okay? Because that's, in my way of like seeing these requirements. Great. It'll become a problem of, you know, the number of things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And what was your name? Where do you Thomas live? Yes. U.S. Oh, nice. Well, it's by Irv. Yeah, no, thanks for, for getting up early. <laughs> I know. And That's very early. Here? I really appreciate it. Because I, I have to think about that time zone all the time. Because I'm in uh, Tokyo and I'm running to so many. It's such oh, a hard yeah. time. <laughs> it's a place I want to visit sometime. Oh, my gosh. You need to. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you. And maybe I'll see you later on Sunday. Probably will. Okay, cool. Awesome. Bye. Uh, excuse me, Daniel, I'm still here. Um, shall I find the portal to the lounge, the social lounge? Hello? All right, just going to do a bit of intro here. Oh, wait. I'm still waiting for the track leaders. Hello. Hello. Yeah, okay, I'm yeah, just yeah, in three just different worlds right now. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I hear some um, reverberation on the mic.
All right, guys, a little bit of an interlude here. Uh, I've got a mean echo coming. Hmm. How's that? Is that better? No. No. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Might. Might. Yeah. <laughs> 